the newly appointed United States Ambassador to Western Germany makes his first official visit to Usurer Headquarters Heidelberg for special welcoming ceremonies. The Honorable Walter C. Dowling is greeted by General C.D. Edelman, Usurer Commander-in-Chief. A 19-gun salute and four ruffles and flourishes mark the arrival of the United States' highest-ranked diplomatic officer in Germany. The two officials move to a reviewing stand facing the headquarters special troops honor guard and stand in front of the flags of their respective offices. The national anthem is played and then General Edelman escorts Ambassador Dowling as he inspects the honor guard. Mr. Dowling is no stranger to Germany, having been Deputy High Commissioner in 1953 and Minister of the American Embassy in 1955 and 1956. Since that time, he has been Ambassador to Korea. The official ceremony ends, and the veteran of 29 years of diplomatic service moves down a reception line of USAFE, USABER, and German generals. Usurer officially welcomes the Honorable Walter C. Dowling, the new United States Ambassador to Western Germany. An international crowd of reporters and photographers from all major news outlets in Germany arrive at Ray Barracks, Friedberg, for a special press conference. The most famous enlisted man in Usurer during the last year and a half is about to go back to his millions of fans. Because he has been almost completely away from singing and acting while in the army, reporters have plenty of questions about the future to ask Sergeant Elvis Presley. Elvis says he plans to continue with his style of rock and roll singing, but without his famous sideburns. However, his greatest interest is now in serious dramatic acting. Also of great interest to reporters are his feelings about the army. When asked by a Screen Digest interviewer if his military experience has been beneficial to him in any way, Elvis said, It's been a big help in both uh, my career and uh, my, my, uh, my personal life because I have, I've learned a lot. i made a lot of friends that I never would have made otherwise. And uh, I've had a lot of good experiences and some bad ones, actually. <laughs> It's good to, uh, to rough it, to put yourself to a test, to see if you can take it, to see if you can stand up. Another uh, thing we hear a lot about in the Army, especially here, is that we are not only soldiers, but goodwill am ambassadors. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Well, I, uh, that's, that's definitely, it stands to reason, because we are in a foreign country, and what we do here uh, will reflect on America and our way of life. As the press conference ends, photographers move in to get that one last picture. An attractive girl reporter gets a kiss, and then an encore as the flash bulbs pop. Elvis has only one day of processing before leaving Usurer. He takes with him many good memories and pride in his military service. The airborne soldier and the tactics he employs are constantly being tested. At Wiesbaden Air Force Base, Germany, paratroopers of the 504th Infantry make last-minute adjustments and then board giant Air Force planes which will carry them to their objective for Operation Fer de Lance. The 504th is the spearhead unit in this training mission. Fer de Lance involves all of the 8th Infantry Division's airborne elements and is scheduled to last for two weeks with the emphasis on night fighting. The Air Force is right on schedule with a flight pattern aimed at a drop zone in southern France. Finally, the warning signal flashes on and the men prepare for the jump. Then, in a few minutes, it's time to strike. In this exercise, small units are being used instead of a large task force. They are dropped over a long period of time, each unit with its own isolated mission to perform in unfamiliar territory.
Operation Fair de Lance provides effective training in airborne tactics for the 504th Infantry. At carnival time, everybody has fun, including the 30th United States Army Band. And why not? It's Fasching time in Munich, Germany. The American band marches by as the record-breaking crowd cheers. But these graceful ladies get the biggest laughs. It might look like the parade is dragging on, but actually it's a swinging affair. Meanwhile, back at the cave, dancing or swinging, everybody has a ball. No parade would be complete without the appearance of a beautiful queen on her special float. It's easy to see that these ladies of dubious quality are put to shame by a lovely queen of Fasching. The United States is well represented by the army band and a street full of cowboys and Indians. What could be more American than the Wild West? It certainly is different from wild western Bavaria. While our boy in bearskin takes a breather, the flashy 30th Army Band, dressed in traditional Bavarian blue and white, lets go with a whole lot of brass and drums. The American soldiers are right in the good old Bavarian groove, and the crowd loves it at the Munich Fasching Parade. At the Royal Air Force Station in Lakenheath, England, both American and British sportsmen have a go at a zany new twist in racing. It's called go-karting. The hardest part of the sport is getting into, or onto, one of these motorized roller skates. But once that's accomplished, there's no end to all the fun you can have, provided you've got a friend to get you started. Go-kart enthusiasts say they're a lot of fun to drive on a twisty course. With U.S. Air Force personnel from five bases participating, this is the largest race ever held in Great Britain under American rules. Round and round they go, and where they stop, it doesn't matter, because not only is there no entrance fee, but there are also no prizes, no winners, no nothing, but a lot of fun. Sunburn, anyone? General Francis W. Farrell, 7th Army Commander, watches Army ring stars battle it out in the 1960 Usurer Boxing Championships at the Kiefertal Germany Sports Arena. Berlin's great light middleweight, Eddie Crook, on the left, defends his title against the 8th Infantry's challenger, Eddie Kitchen, before a turnaway crowd of more than 5,000. Crook is the all-Army and inter-service champ who has his eye on the Olympics, so you can't blame Kitchen for being cautious. In the third round, Kitchen goes down, but the referee rules it a slip. Crook has kept him off balance, throwing everything at Kitchen but the proverbial sink. Kitchen stays on his feet but drops the decision as Eddie Crook retains his light middleweight title. 24th Infantry's defending middleweight champion, Bob Kennard, in the light trunks, meets Lenny Weiner, his challenger from the 3rd Infantry Division. And with so much excitement early in the first round, it's hard to tell who's going to wear out first, the fighters or the audience. Both men seem determined to go home early tonight. Kennard scores heavily, racking up points for the 24th Infantry, which is bidding for its fourth consecutive team championship. After this fight, the boys are going to show signs of wear and tear. And so is this ringside athlete. In the second round, Kennard continues to hit his target. Finally, a smashing right sends Weiner to the canvas. He's down. But with the endurance of this energetic fan, he bounces back and stays on his feet despite a staggering shower of punches. The referee stops the fight, and Kennard is applauded by former boxing star Buddy Bear. Then General Farrell presents awards. 
Both Crook and Kennard retain their titles, and the 24th Infantry Division wins its fourth straight team trophy at the 1960 USABER Boxing Championships.